Good night, ladies and gentlemen. And a special good night to the family of Arrow Castle. Good night. It's always hard to follow a bio like that because people's expectations are set a certain way. So you need to lower back your expectations so I could exceed it and it works out better that way. Well, I was sent this topic by Miss Castle here, which I've rewritten, not purposely, but I just realized she has a different topic than me. ICT transforming creative industries, and the topic that she actually sent, which I rechecked, is ICT transforming cultural industries. But since I normally use these topics as abstract art, it's just to inspire me of what to write, but the actual topic itself is not important. It shouldn't matter much on my presentation. At the end of the lectures that I give, if people don't have more questions than when they started to listen to it, then I made a mistake. So at the end, you shouldn't, I shouldn't be answering your questions. You should, be, you should be having new questions, otherwise something I failed. So at the end, you should have new questions it's like abstract art. When you listen to something, then you should impose, I'm, not going, to, I'm going to ask some questions which I'm not going to answer. Then you're going to use your own experiences, your own feelings, and then you'll apply your answer to it, and depending, we could have a discussion after. So the question that is to be asked, even before we discuss the topic, is what is, because we're talking about creative industries, so what is creativity? When we say that somebody is creative or that they have created art, what exactly do we mean? So when we say that Arrow was a creative person and he did all his great works, and we listened to the Allen Golden Boys, and listening to those music, that music, there are certain emotions that come out, there are certain feelings that come out by the art that was created by these musicians. As Nerissa said, when you listen to Arrow, there are certain feelings that you automatically get. The words instill something in you. So what is it that instill that's in you, that in you? Why do we say these things are creative than just random noise on a paper? So when you hear lyrics like, innocent people get jail, licks with cat and nine tail, innocent man get bust, never know who to trust, advantage, advantage never done. If you grow up in a monster context, there are certain emotions that this, you have certain emotions that you feel separate and distinct if you're grown up in another country or if you're come from Europe. So what is it about that that instill this in you? So that's one of the questions that you are going to ask, which I'm not going to answer. And what is it that, why do we call this art and what makes certain combination of things different? So before I start, I've started, but before I continue, Mr. Greener is going to play a piece while I cycle through some pictures. So... So you hear that music, and if you listen to classical music, you realize it sounds like Vivaldi. And you look at these pictures. And if I ask the question, are these pictures art? Is the music that you just heard art? So keep that in mind. Now, the music that you just heard was not written by a human being. The music that you just heard was completely written by a computer program and played by a computer program. There was no human input. The program was written, 
it was fed, basically the programmers fed it some of how Vivaldi music sounds and asked it to compose something that sounds like that and you get that sound. They had done the experiment where they have played that music composed by these famous com classical composers, Beethoven, etc. Play the music composed by the computer and even classically trained people who know music cannot tell the difference between the music created by the computer and the music written by a human being. So we have to start asking ourselves, what we just heard just now, is it the same music, is it art, is it creative? What's the difference if a human creates it, it was created by an artificial program? The pictures that you just saw, all of them were drawn by a computer. There was no, it wasn't produced on the, the screen of the computer. There's a robotic arm that the program give it the paint, put in how pictures are supposed to look and certain things about how art is composed in terms of shadow and light and colors and how do you put a picture, picture composition together and told it to draw. And it came up with these pictures that you just saw. If I didn't point that out to you, and you had gone into a museum, and you had gone into an art gallery, you would have seen them, and you would have thought that it was drawn by a human being when it was actually drawn by that robot that you saw there, see there. So all the pictures that, you s that was just shown were drawn by that computer. So then we start asking our question, these pieces that are composed and drawn by a computer composed and drawn by a robotic arm with no human input apart from the original program, are they art? And what does it mean in terms of our human ego when we believe that only us have the ability to create certain things? Because history is one of destroying the human ego, basically. We do things and then we say only us can do that, eventually some creative person comes up with a tool, an idea, and takes it away from human. And as we have go, go more and more into our history and into our future, a lot of things that we consider these are the purview of human beings, and this is what makes humans beings special, and you can't take that away from me, you realize that a lot of it is hubris, basically. It is, we have to be more humble. This is not what defines humanity, so that's another question that you need to ask, what actually defines humanity? So, if you're taking notes. Is, if it's not just the ability to produce creative works, because as human beings, we can't tell the difference between works done by a computer and works done by a human being. What is it that defines humanity? So, as we have gone along, we have now figured out that computers can form links between things. They can produce novel works. They can function in ways that we consider creative. So the question is, if computers are producing these works, should we cause them, call them art? So this, this question has come up throughout history. So this is in 1931. The last 20 years, neither matter, nor space, nor time has been what it was from time immemorial. We must expect great innovations to transform the entire technique of the arts therefore affecting artistic invention itself, and perhaps even bringing about an amazing change in our very notion of art. Technology has transformed, and is transforming the creative industries. So, are we approaching a stage where technology is become more, becoming more than just a tool used by, by mankind? Can machines be creative? Is the process of creating art the last stand of humanity against the machine? Because computers now, they now rival our ability to think, and they are now doing things that we now, we used to consider intrinsically human. So the question is, and again, is what if creativity? So there was a 1973 paper again. This, is, this discussion has been going back, way back. The advent of computing simulates a desire to re-examine the subject of creativity. The traditional role of the artist is called into question. It may no longer be necessary to assume that he is a specialist in art. Rather, he is a catalyst 
of the creative activity. Essentially, the artist becomes the gardener rather than the creator. So he or she sets the initial conditions and then you guide the process in the direction and you get the art at the end. So like if you have a garden, you plant the seeds, you water it, and the flowers come at the end, but you don't really produce, you didn't really produce the flowers. Are we reaching a stage where we're removing the artists and the creativity from the process? You give them all these modern tools that put input the original conditions into it and something comes out at the end, is it that what we call art and is it that what we call creativity and what would it mean in the long run for our creative industries if computers can produce these things and people can't tell the difference. And by the way, a lot of pop music, the entire music is produced by computers, there's no human input. You feed into it what's popular and it produces back to you. This is what we think people will listen to. So, there are two ways to look at it. One way, if you want to maintain our humanity, is to say that art requires intent. There must be an intent by the artist to create the activity. So it's not just the output at the end, but why was this program why was this piece commissioned? What was the artist's intention in producing this art? So the programs that generate the music and the programs that generate the art pieces that you just saw, there's no intent. Somebody programmed it into it, press a button, and it gave an output. If Rembrandt is painting a piece, he has an idea in his head what feelings he wants to evoke, what does he want to come out at the end, and he has an intentionality when he starts working. So if we want to maintain that computers don't produce art and it's only humans produce art, you do it from the point of view that humans have intent and computers don't. So the argument is that the works that come, they are not art. Even though if a human had produced the exact same thing, you would have called it art. But because it was produced by the machine without the intent of the end product, it is no longer art and we should call the creator of the program the artist and not the actual program itself. So that's one argument. So it's to argue that art is the skillful and intentional execution of an original idea which conveys a message. So there must be some skill involved. The artist must have some skill that other people in the general populace do not possess. So whether they do sculpture, or music, or plays, or poetry. There's some skill that they have that the general normal human being doesn't have. So, there must be some kind of intentionality. Did the artist have an original idea in mind that they were working about? So it's not just copying somebody's work, it's producing your own work. And is there a message that the artist wants to convey? Is there some kind of feeling that he wants to elicit out of the people that observe, watch, or participate in the piece. So, that's one way in which you can get back human beings back into the process. So this is Van Gogh, and this is, by that definition, this is considered art, because the artist knew where he was going, he had intentionality, he wanted to convey a message, he wanted some kind of emotive feeling to come out of the people that view the art. This is not art, this is just somebody reproducing what Van Gogh did. So that would not be considered art. This is a picture of Keith Richards that was published in Louis Vuitton. This would be considered art because there was an, again, there was an intentionality, there was a message that wanted to be sent, there was a composition that, that had to be done, so this would be considered art. Instagram in your food won't be considered art no matter how much filters you apply to it by that definition. So you eliminate things like, like that. So, so although a computer may be able to generate artistic content, they will never be able to create art. So they're generating artistic content, but they're not generating, they're not creating art independently of a human being giving them instructions. But that's the first part of the 
the argument, not the interesting part. The more interesting part is this part. But before I get to that, I'm going to divert to allow you to process that. Anytime a new tool or a new invention comes about, human beings have used that to express themselves in various ways. So for example, before time we would paint, and painting is what was considered art back in the day, and I say back in the day, back in the 1600s, 1700s. Painting is what artists did on sculpturing. If you did that, you were an artist. Then we invented the camera. Then there was this big argument, the photographs are not art. They're just reproducing what's out there in the real world. The true artist is the person that takes up his canvas, sits down by the river, puts on his hat and paints. That's the artist. The person that just takes a camera and points at something and clicks a button is not art. But we have now accepted that photography is art and we have museums that display photographs and people win awards for such things. So we invented that. We invented radio. From the invention of radio, it brought us popular music. Before time, music was classical music in the form of Bach and Vivaldi and Tchaikovsky and such people. Radio brought us popular music, which is now considered art. Nobody questioned whether pop, well, it's still Christian, but that's a different. <laughs> whether it's considered, it's considered art. We invented aerosol can, we invented graffiti art. We invented electronic synthesizers, etc., and we've invented dance music. We have now, at the stage where we're now trying to experiment with virtual reality, there's going to be an argument whether video games and such things are art, and in 20 years, the answer is going to be, it is art, and I don't know what these old-time people were thinking they need to get with it. This is how it works. Every new, intention, every new invention, because of the human capacity to create things and to conceive of things that didn't exist before and bring them into being, and our desire to express our emotions, we use it to create something that we call art. So, every invention brings a new form of art, and these are the ones that I just went through. Now, this is where the fun, the fun starts. What happens, computers are becoming more and more sophisticated. So right now they just use our tools. I have to program the computer to produce the images. I have to program the computer to produce the music. Can't do it, do it independently of itself. But there's something called Moore's Law and the power of computers are basically doubling every year. Every year they get twice as fast and if you follow that curve, the argument is there's going to become a point where the computers themselves can write programs. So you're going to create a program and that program is going to write its own programs. If that happens, you're going to have an effect where it's building up top one another because they work faster than you, they don't get tired, they don't sleep, and they, wherever the instructions are, they go through it. There's going to be an exponential in advancement and at some point the argument is if that software writes another piece of software that produces these pieces, is it now art? Because it's not the original program. If I have a child, Nerissa has a ch ch her children, and they go out and write a song and they sing it, do you give Nerissa the credit or do you give, <laughs> do you give me the credit? And most people, most logical people, would, <laughs> would accept that you should give the child the credit for the piece that was produced and not Nerissa. So if the computer program writes another computer program that produces these songs and these other things, who gets the credit? Is it the programmer or is it the first program that writes the program or is it the final program that produces the piece? And what does it mean for us as human beings when we start going down that road? So the argument is that certain kind of works are going to become less appealing and desirable as we go along. So you, we're not going to, if you say consider vegetables, some, as we increase our technology, we can now grow perfect tomatoes and perfectly square melons. We have done that. We can grow square melons because they pack easier. We have figured that out. But there are certain kind of people that still want the organic 
product because they consider it pure. So even though you could have a computer that produces this piece and they have these emot the same emotive feelings, because you as another human being know that it wasn't produced by another human, it doesn't have the same value. And the value to you doesn't come from the end product, but from the person that created it from the very beginning. So all, you, know, you might have two pieces and they look exactly the same. Is the one that the human being produces that you consider the most important one. Because as humans, we have ego and we believe that what we do is more important. So the idea is that we're going to shift from more, from just creating, from just art based, from just art that's based on objects to more stuff like experiences, which is harder for a computer to simulate. So there are people now who have things like interactive art. So there's this guy, Lee Mingwe, who has participatory, participatory, interactive, and socially engaging art. So this is one of his pieces. It's basically flowers planted in a, the live flowers planted in a museum, and that's the piece. So how does he explain? How is that different from what you would traditionally consider art, and how do you explain that? So this is in his, his own words. I was fascinated by his examination of the effects of both our total immersion in a market economy and the myth of the free market and our views about gifts and our abilities to give and receive them. So for this piece, I created an inviting space in a gallery containing beautifully presented fresh flowers. Museum guests were invited to take one of these flowers with them when they left the museum. If they would agree to two things, first, they had to make a detour from the intended route when leaving the museum, and second, along this detour, to give the flower to a stranger who they felt would benefit from this unexpected act of generosity. I did not choose to document what happened once the flowers left the museum. As in life, we really learn how far our kindness or unkindness extend. In this project, I chose to let others be kind and leave the rest to fate. The gift I received in return was the knowledge that somewhere in Lyon, during the months of the biennial, some strangers had connected through acts of unexpected giving and receiving. So, because of the way how art is moving and because, my argument, because of the push of computers into the artists, into the art industry, and every time something is produced by a computer, we as humans try to find a way to differentiate ourselves from it, we are now starting to define new ways of artistic expression that are more human-centric, more how we as humans relate to one another in terms of being kind to one another, in terms of our empathy, etc. with the argument being that computers are not there yet. <laughs> so the human mind, the world, art is changing because the world is changing. And every time the world changes, because the way our human mind is, we have the ability as human beings to conceive of things that currently do not exist, which is one of the defining features of humanity. We can conceive of things that don't exist, and we could conceive of what process should we go through to bring it into existence. This is something that we have the ability to, to do. So because of the push and some people saying removing the soul from certain things like music and art and such things. We as humans have now, are now pushing the boundaries into other things that are more human-centric and more interactive. So that was the detour for you to start thinking about what do we mean by the creative industries and what Again, the same question I keep asking, what do we consider art and what do we consider legitimate forms of human expression in the terms of the artistic field? So going back to the, the point I said about photography, and to repeat, when before the invention of the camera, we, draw, we drew on canvas and we painted on canvas, and that was art. The technicians and the inventors came up with the camera, the artists and the art school rebelled and said that the pictures that you taken are not art. As progress went, that has changed. We now accept photographs as art. To make it worse, after that, we invented film. 
The moment film was invented and they started to tape things, the traditionalists, in quotes, rebelled again because theater is what is filmed. Th is when you go onto the stage and interact with the argument, this is what the art is. And nobody going on stage, repeating back their lines and changing camera angles and doing all this stuff. That cannot be what art is and they are degrading the field. So this is what, when, he put, when this came out, this was a critic who wrote about what film actors meant. And as you listen to these things, the reason I'm doing it is that now that we are so far removed from it, it seems strange that people will say things like that. But then you have to bring yourself forward and say we know currently in 2016 and new forms of expression are coming in and we have to ask ourselves why do we have this reaction towards it and we define everything as is that this is what defines art and this foolishness that these children are doing or whatever is doing, that's not art. So transport yourself back and realize what people are saying, come back to the present and remember that you're doing the same thing and your children are going to laugh at you and call you old. <laughs> so, the film actor, Vaud Pirandello, feel as if in exiled. Exiled not only from the stage, but also from himself. With a vague sense of discomfort, he feels inexplicable, inexplicable emptiness. His body loses its corporeality. It evaporates. It is deprived of reality, life, voice, and the noises caused by his moving about. In order to be changed into a mute image, flickering an instant on the screen, then vanishing into silence. The projector will play with his shadow before the public, and he himself must be content to play before the camera. So that was a critic talking about comparing the film actor to an actor on an actual stage. And Dua Hamel, another critic wrote, calls a movie a pastime for helots, a diversion for uneducated, wretched, worn out creatures who are consumed by their worries, a spectacle which requires no concentration and presupposes no intelligence, which kindles no light in the heart and awakens no hope other than the ridiculous one of someday becoming a star in Los Angeles. So that's when film face first came out and that's what the critics were saying about movies. So there's, there's this ancient lament that every time something comes out, the critics oppose it. Now we have art festivals, we have film festivals, we have films that are considered a legitimate expression of human creativity and art. So again, chance sometime to understand the present circumstance that you're in, you need to transfer yourself back and see what people are saying and then transfer yourself forward and see if you're making the same mistake as your predecessors. And you're gonna make it because everybody believes that they're at the peak of civilization. Every civilization believes that they're at the peak, and this is it, and this is how things are going to be, and then the, the, the world changes when the children come. This idea that change comes from people is false. Change comes from funerals. When you die and your children take over. Even in fields like science where we believe that that takes place, which it tells you that scientists go to this and because of the logic and the other thing, this is how science progresses, again, false. This old scientists who come up with an idea refuse to let go of it because of ego. Is the young ones come and take it over and eventually they die and the young people take over. So this is the process of humanity. So, children should feel happy. <laughs> and the older ones should also feel happy you won't be around to sit and laughing at you. So that's film. Uh, that's Rembrandt. So you see a man looking away with all the rich, the way how Rembrandt painted was with his rich colors, the subtle emotion, the characteristic brush strokes and the evocative play of light and shadow. That's how the Dutch artist Rembrandt painted. He's considered one of the greatest artists to have existed. He was born in 1606 in Amsterdam. And he was famous for his realistic subject matter, rich color palette, subtle and nuanced depictions of emotion, and gorgeous use of shadow and light. He died penniless in 1699. 
He did about 346 paintings and two of the most popular ones are this one, this storm on the Sea of Galilee and Night Watch. So he's considered one of the most famous artists and his things are worth millions if you could obtain one or if you could see one. Now, why did I bring that up? There was a project by an art institute in Amsterdam who basically contacted some computer scientists and asked them, can you write a program that can produce art in the style of Rembrandt? So that was the challenge they were given. Write a computer program and see if you can produce art in the style of Rembrandt. This piece that you see here, well, not light is bothering me, but if you actually see it, and you show even at professionals, they cannot tell the difference between the Rembrandt piece and the piece that the computer came up with. Because it wasn't just drawing it on the screen, you know, the computer is the same, like you said before, with the using the actual paint and other processes so that you can't get fooled because it looks smooth. It actually has the indentation as if it was painted. So that's the piece that they came up with. And people, unless you know all of Rembrandt pieces, cannot tell the difference. What happened when this came out and what was the reason for this reaction is the other question. So the moment this came out, there was an article in The Guardian, the digital Rembrandt, and knew where to mock art made by fools. He was arguing that it's a travesty based on surface trickery, and that no computer art could match the emotional heft of a human original. And then he continued, what a horrible, tasteless, insensitive, and toastless travesty of all that is creative in human nature. What a vile product of our strange time when the best brains dedicate themselves to the stupidest challenges when technology is used for things it should never be used for, and for everybody feels obligated to applaud the heartless result because we so revere everything digital. That was his piece. And the question is, why, what would cause, most people feel have that sentiment, by the way, what would cause somebody to have this reaction, this emotive reaction to a piece created by a computer that matched back painting that was done into 1606. What a vile product of our strange time when the best brain dedicate themselves to the stupid challenges. When technology is used for things it should never be used for, and everybody feels obliged to applaud the heartless results because we so revere everything digital. He went in to argue that it can't be art because the computer cannot show the depth, cannot look into Rembrandt's eyes as he does his painting, he cannot go back into the time in which the painting was done, he cannot see all the hardship that Rembrandt went into to produce the piece. And he's saying in the original Rembrandt piece, we can glimpse his very soul. It's not style and surfeit effects that makes his painting so great but the artist's capacity to reveal his inner life and make us aware in turn of our own inferiority. To experience an uncanny contact soul to soul, let's call it the Rembrandt shudder. That feeling I long for and get in front of every true Rembrandt masterpiece. Is that a mystical claim? The implication of the digital Rembrandt is that we get too sentimental and moist-eyed ab about art and his great art, just a set of mannerisms that can be digitized. And he's saying he disagrees. He disagrees that great art is just a set of mannerisms that can be digitized. If it's mystical to see Rembrandt as a special and unique human being who created unrepeatable, inexhaustible masterpieces of perception and intuition, then call me a mystic. So that was the article that came out, and the question we have to ask ourselves as human beings, why do we have such visceral reaction to things like that? So think about that one. But in the comment section, to the opposing view, commenting on the article, this is just so much pretentious preening bollocks. 
How is a fake dead? Does it only become dead once it's exposed as a fake? But it was full of life and genius as long as it was good enough to fool the experts. And is all of this just basically a howl to the moon about the shrinking intellectual territory that we humans can still claim to be ours alone? And that's a powerful statement. So if all is this, one of the answers is this reaction to all of this, a howl to the moon about the shrinking intellectual territory that we humans still claim to be ours and ours alone. So, in 1964, this is, I'm not sure what this is an abstract piece that was displayed in 1964. So in 1964, a new avant-garde artist was introduced to the art scene in the Swedish city of Gothenburg, featuring four paintings in the gallery Christiane. The fresh new artist was Pierre Brusso, and his work received rave reviews both from critics and art fans. He even sold one masterpiece to a collector for $90, which is about $650 today. The exhibition featured paintings from artists across Europe, but it was this new French artist who stole the show. One critic in particular, Rolf Adeberg, who was so overwhelmed by Pierre's talent that he wrote the following review about his work, which appeared in print the morning following the exhibition. So this was his review. Brazil paints with powerful strokes, but also with clear determination. His brush strokes twist with furious fastidiousness. Pierre is an artist who performs with the delicacy of a ballet dancer. So that review came out after the work came out. And there were a lot of other positive reviews that came out from this new artist, Pierre Brasso, in 1964. Except one artist whose review of the, the work was, only an ape could have done this. That was his review. So there's another, under all the positive reviews in the newspaper, one reviewer said, only an ape could have done this. Little did people realize that he was correct. The whole thing was a hoax created by a tabloid journalist to show if critics could really distinguish what was good art. And Pierre Brosso was actually a chimpanzee from the Swedish zoo, and all the critics fell into his trap. So with that, the question you ask, so ask, ask yourself, what is art? I thank you. Sorry. Yeah, my observation is you started your presentation with Arrow, and I go back to Nerissa, yeah? Because art for me involves more than painting, writing books or whatever. I know computer programs can do all these things, but, and I know artificial intelligence is coming, but I want to know if you think that a computer program is coming that will create the energy that is transferred from the artist to the audience in someone like Arrow? Two things. <laughs> Two things. I purposely did that for purpose. As I said at the beginning, my intention for you, it was for you to start thinking as the, the piece is an abstract piece for you to impose your own thing on it and not my personal view, but I still, I still answer it. Because part of my presentation and the argument is that art is not the end product per se, but it's the, the human being that created it. And the culture, for example, the thing I did remember, the culture that he came out of and the poverty that he went through and all his experiences is, a, is what you're actually buying into and not the piece. So when Arrow produces this piece and the song that I chose at the beginning, Advantage Never Done, that song would have a resonance, 
we resonate in Montserrat very much differently than we rena resonate in America and Europe, etc. Because of the culture he came out of, and because he came out of a similar culture of slavery and such things, trying for we as people trying to get somewhere, and we believe that the man, the always the man, is oppressing, is oppressing us. So that song will resonate to you because I will grow up in this culture, and you also grew up in the culture. So the significance of this song is not per se the words, it is the intention behind the words to evoke a certain kind of feeling out of the listening audience. So even though a computer can produce similar words, and they do, you do not have the same emotional attachment to it because it's not a, you know it's not a human being and a computer currently don't have those experiences. So that's one way to look at it. The theater, which endures until today. Dance, which endures until today. Music, um, voice, the interpretation of maybe works that are dead or even works produced by a computer program. When a human uh, interprets that music, in performance, it does something that I think until now computers cannot do. Right, which is, and I agree with that, which is part of the th thing I did with the new artist, Lee Mengwe. What computers, what human beings have done, that when computers go into a field, they have basically moved into a different one where they, where they say computers can't do. So in terms, of, I say for the actual performer to go on the stage and perform, we haven't reached that stage yet. So human beings still could claim that, well, we can do that, and machines can do that, and therefore we are superior in all these things that human beings love to do. Sure. Different. Because even like music, computers can write classical music, and they can write it just as good as the classical composer, because even classically trained musicians cannot distinguish, and that is the Turing test. The human beings cannot distinguish between a computer work and the human work, you should consider them the same. Pop music computers write them from beginning. They, they, what they have done is they have, they have took the popular songs, they have input them into a program, you analyze it to find what beats that people like and what songs sell, and from that, it writes the music. All you do is put your voice on it. So computers already write a lot of the popular songs that you hear. So that's already done. But what, as I try to argue what human beings have done when that has happened is to move themselves into other fields like theater and like performance, interactive art, where they're saying computers haven't reached there yet. All the Japanese are getting robots, so we're getting there. Okay, I find okay. The, <laughs> your presentation fascinating and enlightening, if I may say so. Um, you emphasized computer producing art. But I'm very pleased that at least implicit in your presentation, you're using words like feed-in and input, suggesting thereby that um, there are still human beings behind the computer. So there was at least a partnership. And the other point I'd like to make is that um, I believe in progress. But I hope nobody, I hope the younger people don't start shooting us impatient for creative advancement. <laughs> Thank you. Because that's the original argument that if you use your easel and your brush to paint a thing, you don't give the credit to the easel and the brush, you give it to the person that does it. So is the programmer who writes the program the actual artist, or is it the program that produces the piece? Currently, we can argue that there has to be some human input to write the program. But the counter argument, because people are saying, because there's a human input there to teach the computer what is music. But if you consider how it works in real life, you have to teach the other human being what music is. You have to teach them scales, you have to teach them notes, you have to teach them how the... So you're still teaching them the same way. So if I'm teaching the computer what music is by programming is, and then producing it, 
Why are you claiming it was you? But as I said, art is an emotional thing, and it is the person who interacts with it that defines whether they consider it an artistic piece. And that, it has an effect when you know it was a human being on the other end that produces it. For him, things like Martin Luther's speech, it's not the speech per se, you know, is the time it was given, the situation it was given in, the circumstances it was given in. All of that contributed to the feeling you get when you listen to it. It's not just the raw words. So we humans being are still holding on to the notion that, yes, we have these emotions. So when we write our poems and we write our novels and we produce our pieces, there's a human intent behind it to convey a message which the computers do not yet have. Very interesting lecture, thank you very much. Um, sometimes we hear that a famous picture has been stolen and it was worth millions, or a, a somebody bought a famous pi artist's picture for millions of dollars, and somebody else did a, 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 another one that was a fake, and it was found out to be a fake, and this is so awful. But for me, if it, you get pleasure out of looking at the picture, it doesn't really matter if it's a famous artist or if it's a fake or if it was done by a computer. It's if you hang that picture on your wall at home, whether it gives you pleasure rather than whether it's actually art, I think that's the most important thing. So that's just a point. The art critics would, would disagree with you. But that's, the exact point. that's another point because there are fakes that people have done of these famous things. And some of them have been in a museum for years and nobody knows the difference. Yeah, and, and everybody gives pleasure. That's and everybody the main comes thing. in and they sit down on the chair and they sit down there for the hours and they stare at it and they, mm -hmm. they proclaim all this because of these lines. I have this feeling and this. At no point ever occurs to them to say, I don't have these feelings that comes out from watching the picture. They sit down and they, they enjoy it and they go back and they said, Wow, that was a maj majestical spiritual experience. It now comes out that the picture was fake, it was created by another artist. And all of a sudden, you feel different. <laughs> but for most of us, we, we would still get pleasure from that picture. So we shouldn't really feel any different. But it's we are still, going to feel different. It's still <laughs> art because there was a lot of skill that went into copying the technique of that famous artist <laughs> to make the fake. And then the question becomes, why is it that you feel different? What, what, what's the, why is it that created or oh, I, was, I was fooled and it's not really the real piece. Even though two hours ago, you were waxing lyrical about the spiritual experience you were having in observing it. All of a sudden, somebody says, the news came over, when you go home, it was a fake piece and you feel down. <laughs> it, it's a question of value and what do you value? It's not the object, if you realize it's not the object that you value. which is a separate point where we have to be careful about valuing objects because you're going to realize in the end it's not actually the... Most old people, not old, that's a bad word to use, most people on their dying bed, when you ask them what they regret, they're going to tell you that they regret, this is a diversion, they regret collecting objects and not collecting experiences. And that's the thing you're going to always get. It's not the object. The reason why you feel down is not because you value the object is the experience of knowing that this person in 1600 and all this produced this piece. It's not the actual object itself. So on a different note, you have to be careful. Remember that life is about experiences, not things. The, the, other, the observation that I have is about how um, ICTs um, are playing are playing a major role, I think, in um, the theft of intellectual property, which to me is a big, a big aspect of creative industries, cultural industries, however you, you want to look at it. And I just wondered whether you had any thoughts on that. The intellectual argument is a complicated one because <laughs> 
people want credit for their work. You like to know that, but they also that people also want artists want credit for their work. But artists also want recognition for their work that other people have done it. And there's a fight between you produce an idea, why is it yours? It's just an idea in your head. Why does it belong to you? And that's a battle that's never going to be won because there are monetary reasons for people wanting the work to be theirs. There's also personal reasons I created it and I want my name to be associated with this piece, why it should be mine. But there are other arguments that the moment you have, say like a CD, you have produced the original CD and the song belongs to you. If I copy it and give somebody else, you still have your CD. Why are you angry? I haven't taken your, your CD from you. You still have it. I have a, I have a copy. So the, the, the question of what, what is it that you actually own and can you take a claim on things that comes out of the, the human brain, basically? Because certain things we agree that you can't, and certain things that we agree that you can. So I could put a string of words and I can't claim copyright. Another person put a string of words and they claim copyright. What was the difference between the two? Well, apart from your lawyers, what was the difference between the, the two? And that's a question that could never be, that's not going to be answered. Because there's going to always be people that you're part of humanity, you produce things for the benefit of all humanity, and if you live in our society, we're going to, we have a right to it. And then there's always going to be the individual, individualistic argument, I produce it, it's mine, if you want it, pay for it. And there's going to be that, depend on where we as human beings, as a society, wants it to be. Because if you go to a theater, they tell you don't take pictures, don't record it, and all these things. <laughs> you mentioned Rembrandt. You, a lot of the focus was on Western artists. Yeah. yeah. But there's a world of art beyond the West. The West. Yeah. And there's also artistic expression which is linked to culture, um, religion, uh, why is, why is a, a dance or a, a film of a dance uh, art and a dance in a uh, South American village in an Indian ceremony, why is it not also art? For me, it, it, this is also art and it's springing from a very old source of art, yeah? And uh, I think computers will never affect that as long as those societies endure. Yeah. One answer, one answer, because I'm just giving answers, mm -hmm. <laughs> is Western cultural imperialism, if you want to go down that road. You grew up, remember, the, uh, the things that you appreciate are based on the culture that you're from, you know? If you grew up in the Caribbean and you grew up listening to soca and reggae, and you go to America, when it starts playing, there's a different feeling that you get to know. But if you go up in America and you go up in the South and you listen to country music, when it starts playing, you get a different feeling. You're going to have this big argument, oh, country music is not good and reggae is really has the beat. But it's because you grew up in a Western society with these beats in you. And the beats are tied. It's a different topic, but it's tied to your language and the way that you, you speak. So you say when you grow up in non-Western countries, in Islamic countries and Asian cultures, the music that you listen to and the art that you appreciate is completely different based on the religious culture that you grew up in, etc. And even the entire society, because Western society is more an individualistic type society. Asian societies are more a group type society. So they perceive the world differently because of the Western religions and the 
Islamic and Chinese spiritual systems, we also perceive the world differently. The music I listen to, the, the feelings and, of empathy that you get, all of it is different and it comes from your upbringing, which is a lot of things that people do not appreciate. A lot of people like to believe that the person you are now is somehow when you were 16 and you found yourself, you came up with all these ideas and it did not come from somewhere. It came from somewhere. There's a reason why you wear jeans and there's a reason why you dress like that. And there's a reason why you feel comfortable wearing jeans and if you try to wear a skirt and you're not from Scotland, you feel funny. But you're going to argue that jeans are what you're supposed to be wearing, but there's nothing special about jeans, just the, the clothing that we chose to wear in the culture that we grew up in. It's the same thing in the art that we appreciate. A lot of it comes from the culture that we grew up in and the music that you appreciate comes from the culture that you grew up with. And for humans who want to hang on to their humanity, as you said, computers will never have that. They will never come from a child and grow up and have all these feelings and fall in love and got broken hearted and all these things. They will never experience, you will never make them into to write this sad song. It's not gonna happen. They could read about it, but reading about it and experiencing it are not the, the same thing. So we could still hold on to the fact that we have experiences and the computers don't. <laughs> it's for the recording. It's for the recording. <laughs> I realize that there are artists that transcend the individual culture out of which they've come. For example, Bob Marley saved me in Zanzibar, yeah? Because when I could tell people that I was born on the same island as Bob Marley, it opened a whole lot of doors because people in Zanzibar listened to Bob Marley. Young people in Oman listened to Bob Marley and they, they um, identify with what he sang about because they share some of that experience. So I think that art, or artists, true artists, Arrow, Marley, David Rudder, these people have communicated way beyond the culture that they have come out of because they touch, they touch a chord in anyone who has experienced what they are singing about. And I agree, because remember that we're all human beings and there's certain characteristics that all human beings have, unless you're a psychopath. Things like empathy, and things that, like love, and things like understanding that there's another human being there and they have thoughts. That, that's not a simple concept, because animals don't have it. Animals do not have a sense of self human beings have it, that I exist. So there are certain common characteristics that we have. I say like love, the sense of wonder. There's a sense of spirituality that all human beings have regardless of culture, which you've expressed in different ways. So if you're an artist and you manage to touch upon these core things, I agree you will be able to transcend culture and religion and geographic location because there are certain core things that makes us human beings which to me is what art always tries to express, is this part of human beings that core to it, that resonates with you, whether it's love or hate, and this core human emotion that bypasses your, your thinking ability, for the better or the worse, depending. So it, before I, to wrap up, remember that the last slide I gave with the monkey is to remember that, as Miss Katie Buffon says, if you enjoy something, don't let people come and try to tell you that this is not art. You are the one that defines whether it's art or not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.